So it's the end of chapter three, that is the theoretical chapter about theorems regarding differentiable functions, the mo most important of which is this thing called the mean value theorem or MVT, MVT, MVT. It's very, very valuable to mathematicians because it can be used to prove lots of other theorems and that makes mathematicians happy. How is it stated? You can state it as an if then sentence. If something is true, then something else is guaranteed to be true. I'm gonna use notation that I haven't used before. I'm gonna write the function name right here and then a colon, the domain right here. And this you can see is the closed interval from A to B, notice the square brackets. It's assumed A is less than B, imagine a number line. Okay, I'll draw one. A is less than B. The closed interval from A to B includes every number between A and B and also the endpoints. That's the domain of the function. That's where the inputs are in that interval and the outputs are real numbers. I love making this fancy double struck R for the real numbers. This is the real numbers. And as a set for this function, this is the set of all possible outputs. Not necessarily every number, every real number is an output. So the function is not necessarily onto, we say. Some people call this the range. Some people call it the target. I prefer calling it the codomain. That's the name I prefer. I prefer using the word range for the actual set of all outputs. These are just possible outputs. It's telling you they are real numbers. If this is continuous on the closed interval from A to B and differentiable has a derivative, on the open interval from A to B, notice I'm using parentheses there instead of square brackets. That's the open interval from A to B, not including the endpoints. The conclusion is that then there exists a number C somewhere between A and B in this open interval I'm going to write C and then a Greek letter epsilon and then the open interval. That Greek epsilon doesn't quite look like the same epsilon that I made with those other proofs back a month and a half ago, but it essentially means in more officially is an element of, but it's, you can say in for short. C is an element of the interval from A to B, meaning it's a number between A and B. Just kind of a fancy notation to say that. Such that F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A. And I mentioned last time and we'll emphasize today with examples that this means there's some place C where the slope of the tangent line F prime of C equals the slope of the secant line between the two extremes on the graph, the left and right endpoints of the graph. Let's do a couple examples today to illustrate this. We'll start with a quadratic function. This is example one. Oh, how about two X squared uh, minus five X minus two over the interval A to B. Oh, let's make it be negative one to five. What am I interested in doing with this example? I'm interested in, in illustrating the truth of the mean value theorem. I'm not trying to apply this to some real life application. 
I'm trying to understand what the theorem means for this example. That's all I'm trying to do. The theorem says if the function's nice and quadratics are certainly nice, they're nice and continuous and differentiable everywhere over the entire real line, so certainly over this interval they are. It's certainly continuous over the closed interval. It's certainly differentiable on the open interval. It's, it's continuous and differentiable over bigger intervals, but certainly works here too. What's the value of C that will make this true? I can solve for it. Find F prime of X. I get four X minus five. What is F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A? A is negative one, B is five. This is F of five minus F of negative one divided by five minus negative one. You gotta figure out what those numbers are. Think about the formula. Five squared is 25 times two is 50. Five times five is 25. 50 minus 25 is 25. Minus two is 23. Check that I don't make a mistake in your head. That'll help keep you awake too. Double check that I didn't make a mistake there. How about if I plug in negative one? Negative one squared is positive one times two is positive two. Minus five times negative one is really the same as plus five, right? Five times negative one is negative five. Minus negative five is the same as plus five. So we've got two plus five minus two is five. Five minus negative one is six. This becomes 18 over six, which is three. The slope of the secant line between the two given points at A and B is three. Let's start to draw a picture of what's going on here. If you graph this function, turns out it looks about like this. It's an upward pointing parabola because the coefficient of the X squared term is positive. It's got a Y intercept of negative two its slope at x equals zero, I know from experience, is the same as the coefficient of x, negative five. So it's got a negative slope there. It keeps going down a little bit before going back up again. F of five is 23. So it crosses the horizontal axis somewhere before five. Maybe five is right about here. Negative one is right about there. F of negative one is five. We see that five right there. And F of five is up at 23. This is not perfectly to scale. Not a perfect picture. We just found that the slope of the line segment connecting these two points is three. The mean value theorem guarantees a number C between negative two and five, where the slope of the tangent is also three. Somewhere just to the right of the minimum there, maybe somewhere right around here, the slope of the tangent might be also three. F prime of C is, well, plug in C in place of X is four C minus five, I want to set this equal to three, the slope of the secant line and solve for C. Add five to both sides, divide both sides by two. It looks like C is two. Is that right? Yeah, I know it's right. I didn't make a mistake. Do notice two is the midpoint of the interval from negative one to five, halfway between them, right? It's three units from negative one and three units from five. Is that an accident? Not with quadratics. If your function is quadratic, the C guaranteed to exist in the mean value theorem will be in the midpoint of the interval from A to B. It'll be A plus B over two. The average of the endpoints. Average of five and negative one is five plus negative one over two, four over two, which is two. 
It's not an accident for quadratics. But if you've got some other function, the C doesn't have to be the midpoint between A and B. For example, with example two, we'll do a cubic example. Let's let F of X be, how about X cubed minus five X squared minus three X plus two. Now, I just made this example up off the top of my head, and I'm also about to make up the interval from A to B up off the top of my head. Because I'm just sort of randomly putting this, pulling this cubic out of my brain, it's not clear what the C or C's might be. There might be more than one of them. The theorem guarantees at least one, but there might be more than one. It's not even clear that the C's are gonna be a nice number like two. They could be irrational numbers. Maybe you even have a guess. We got to take the derivative there, set it equal to something else. I'll have to use maybe the quadratic formula in the end. What interval am I going to pick? Oh, how about I pick negative four to uh, seven? Okay, I'm probably going to need my calculator here. What's f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a? That'll be f of seven minus f of negative four divided by seven minus negative four. f of seven is gonna be seven cubed minus five times seven squared minus three times seven plus two, plugging in x equals seven, looks like it's 79. f of negative four, I'll do the cubing and squaring in my head. Negative four cubed is negative 64. Negative four squared is positive 16, multiply by negative four again, you get negative 64. Negative four squared, yeah, positive 16. So this is minus five times 16. Minus three times negative four is plus 12, plus two, negative 130. Seven minus negative four is 11. This becomes 79 plus 130. That'll be 209 over 11. Two hundred nine over 11 is about, well, it turns out to be exactly 19. How about that? That did turn out to be a nice number. It didn't have to be. It could have been a fraction. Double check that I didn't make a mistake there. I think it's right. So 19 is the slope of the secant line. It's pretty steep. What about the slope of the tangent? F prime of C, I take the derivative of F, plug in C, I'll get three C squared minus 10 C minus three, right? Look up there, take the derivative in your head, replace X with C. Set this equal to 19, solve for C. I bet I will get irrational answers here. I wanna subtract 19 from both sides. If I was really lucky, I might be able to factor that, but I don't think I'm lucky here. Use the quadratic formula. X is equal to negative B plus or minus. Okay, I won't sing it. Negative B is 10 plus or minus square root of B squared is 100 minus four times A times C all over two times A. Two times three is six. 10 over six is five thirds. The thing under the square root becomes 100 plus, let's see, 22 times 12, 264 plus 100, 364. Oh, did that turn out nice? Oh, uh, no, okay, 364, it's, it's not, a, not a perfect square. 
there's the approximate square root of 364 divided by six. <laughs> this is approximately 3.18. Five thirds is the same as 1.6 repeating. So we've got 1.6 plus or minus 3.18. Now it's possible that one or both of these, well, okay, it's actually only possible that one of them might not be in the interval. But I believe they both are. 1.6 repeating minus that. It's about negative 1.51 and 1.6 repeating plus 3.18 is about 4.85. And yes, both of those are in the interval from negative four to seven. They are both C values that the mean value theorem, the mean value theorem itself guarantees at least one of them, but they are C values, two C values that fit the conclusion. What's the picture look like? Something like, uh, Something like this. More extreme than what I'm drawing. There's the secant line. And there's two tangent lines that have the same slope. All these ex examples do, like I mentioned 10 minutes ago, is just illustrate the theorem. There's nothing significant about these examples except that they illustrate the truth of the theorem for these examples. That's all they do. But the theorem is true in a very general sense. F doesn't even have to have a nice formula. It could be a complicated formula. Maybe it's impossible to actually solve for C by hand. But the theorem guarantees the C still exists. Turns out in many applications, you don't really care what C is, as long as it's between A and B. Some applications I can think of, one comes up in Calc 2 in, well, it's a more general setting in trying to estimate functions and error terms in approximations, kind of like we did with linear approximations Monday, maybe last week, we talked about error. It's a good idea in a subject called numerical analysis, which is all about computer programs to do math, to estimate answers to math questions, to know how the error behaves. Because you're always going to make errors, partially because of computer error, partially because of the numerical technique, like a linear approximation, not giving you the exact answer by its very nature. Being able to understand the errors which can come from theorems like the mean value theorem is a useful thing. And again, you may not care exactly what C is, but knowing it exists is still helpful for bounding the errors and helping you figure out with your algorithm how many steps to do in that kind of thing in your algorithm to estimate something. Okay, so it does have practical importance. 